All right, what you're seeing here is my Two Trees Sapphire Core XY 3D printer, which has now been all insulated with a heated chamber that goes on top of that. And that means that I can print with high temperature plastics like polycarbonate, PEK maybe, uh, these types of plastics that shrink a lot. Okay, so let's look at ABS. We've all experienced ABS and the shrinkage and it peels up as it shrinks, it peels up off the bed. And the reason it's doing that is because of the differential shrinkage because the part that's touching the bed is hotter than a couple of layers up. So the cooler layers have shrunken more and those layers of high shrinking are like a rubber band pulling it from the top which pulls those sides up, okay? So if you can get the whole part to stay the same temperature and then pull it out of the printer and it's all the same temperature and the whole part shrinks together, then you don't get the peeling and you don't get um, what can happen is higher up the, the layer lines can actually separate from each other. And it's the same thing that's going on where the part is peeling, uh, it's cooling down differently uh, you know, at the different layers. So um, all these types of problems are eliminated in a heated chamber. And honestly, I don't know why this isn't much more widely used. A heated chamber is so important. The $35,000 Stratasys machines, the very machines that Dr. Adrian Boyer was looking at when he was saying, this isn't that hard to accomplish, we can do this in an open source way, all that, those machines have been inside of enclosures since the get-go, since the, since, you know, since the starting gun went off, I think. You know? So the heated chamber patent, now there was a patent that was kind of specific, it was like a specific way to do heated chambers, and that thing finally expired. Okay, so now there's absolutely no claim, there's no intellectual property preventing anyone from implementing heated chambers. And I, I think that we, it's the most important thing that we can see on, coming on printers going forward from now on. We absolutely need to see professional uh, solutions coming, you know, that you can just buy so you don't have to DIY something. And here's the kicker, you guys. There's many chambers out there, but they need to be sealed and insulated. They need to be sealed and insulated. <laughs> like stop wasting energy. Stop trying to pump in so much heat into that chamber when you have like metal, thin metal sides and that, you know, they're not gonna do anything to hold the heat in there. You're just gonna be radiating all that heat out into the room. You know, then your room gets really hot and ugh, you know. Think of it as an oven or like an igloo ice box for camping. You really want that insulation to hold the heat in there. Uh, that's what needs to happen. So the title of this thing is why isn't that happening, right? Why is nobody doing this? Why is nobody making a sealed, insulated chamber from industry that just, you know, does a great job keeping the air temperature around your prints elevated until you remove the print from the chamber? That absolutely needs to happen. And because I can't buy it, I made one. So let's get into the video. We'll back up a little bit and I'll show you exactly how I got here and exactly what it does. I've got my little Cube Core XY 3D printer taken apart. This started life as the what's uh, Two Trees Sapphire S 3D printer. And the great thing about this printer is, look at those are the XY motion steppers. So the only electronics that sit above the uh, the floor here are the heated bed and you know what's ever over there on the uh, on the hot end on the other side of the bed. So. Now, of course, you're going to have a stepper motor for the hot end and blah, blah, blah. But almost all the electronics, the brains, all the steppers, everything is below the floor. It's a really fantastic design. And it's just a tragedy that we haven't seen this on any other printers coming out of China. This is absolutely a superior way to do things, and I wish we saw more of it. But I have it taken apart so that I could make this template out of cardboard. Um, this is going to get cut out of the styrofoam here. And let's talk about this. I've been playing with a lighter on this corner, and you can see... The styrofoam melts extremely easily with a little bit of flame. So I've got this tape. That's this stuff here. It's actual aluminum foil with uh, some pretty serious adhesive backing to it. This is used in the uh, HVAC uh, systems. So you, you can find that at your local hardware store. And I thought maybe it would act as a heat shield. So let's just try the very corner here. We'll cover all that up and we'll put that up against it. So if we have a flame directly on it uh, right there at the corner, it's still substantially melts. Yeah, that's goopy. So definitely helps, but um, doesn't prevent it from, from burning. So absolutely not fireproof. And this was not my intended original material for the enclosure. 
you see, I showed up at my local lumber yard. Uh, this was a few months ago, quite a few months ago. And I asked them for some polyurethane foil backed uh, four by eight sheets. I just wanted the one, right? And uh, the guy didn't understand what I was asking for. And he didn't clarify. He didn't ask me. He just said, okay, it's ordered. And he ordered the polystyrene. So he saw poly and he thought poly is poly, polyurethane, polystyrene. But in fact, I didn't want polyurethane. There's no such thing, I don't think. But there is this polyisocyanurate. Uh, and it's just called polyiso or iso. And this stuff has way better fire resistance compared to the styrofoam. So this is the stuff to get. And if you guys are going to do this project, uh, definitely go get your, your iso or polyiso panels. See, here's the red up talking about the fire performance of polyiso panels. So they are a winner in that regard. And of course, if you really want fireproof, you can go get some mineral wool, which is basically spun rock fibers. They get rocks really hot and they stretch them out and they turn it into a, an insulation. So it's pretty much fireproof. Um, yeah, so that's, they can get foil backed mineral wool as well. So there's, there's that option. But yeah, I ended up with this $20 sheet of uh, poly or po yeah, polystyrene styrofoam. And I didn't turn it down. You know why I didn't turn it down? Because on the front and the back of it was a sheet of half inch plywood all contained in the same thing. Each of those sheets now costs $50. So I got $100 worth of free uh, plywood for the cost of a $20 sheet of styrofoam. I'm keeping it. The chamber is going to work just fine. Yeah, the plywood was just there to protect the styrofoam in shipping. They're used to shipping, you know, stacks, maybe 20, 20 sheets deep or something like that with the with the piece of plywood in the top and the bottom. But I had a custom one-off order, and so they shipped it with one sheet that way. All right, so I'm cutting up all the styrofoam just with this long knife, and it cuts uh, quite cleanly. So I, I do a couple of passes like so. So I've got my floor installed and the uh, pieces that surround the frame. And now these are going to be uh, the outer shell, like the actual shell that keeps all the, the heat inside there. And this is what's going to be exposed to me, to the outside. And I don't like all this printing, so I'm just going to peel off the, you know, plastic film on this side. Yeah, that'll look a lot nicer. Stinks though, but it'll look better. Let's talk about the design. So you can see that I've got these um, pillars here being covered. And why would I do that when this whole apparatus is gonna slide down and completely enclose this? Well, the reason is for uh, a concept called thermal bridging. So metal is a very good conductor of heat. And if I didn't have these, uh, these on here, then what would happen is the heat in the chamber would migrate to this uh, vertical upright here, and it would basically become a, a heat sink. And this exposed portion outside would then just bleed the chamber heat right to the outside. But by sort of encasing them with some uh, with some other polystyrene, I am hoping to mitigate that effect of that thermal bridge. Now, I'm not going to go to the trouble to uh, cover all of this top plate because I figure that's a long bridge right there. So this top plate can get nice and warm. There's four little uh, attachment points, and I'm, I'm just hoping to not have too much thermal bridging because that's the only problem uh, with this uh, printer design. But what you're not seeing is a heater, and I haven't added one yet. I might do that in the future. What I'm hoping is that I can get away with just using that super burly bed heater. So this is a 110 volt, uh, you know, AC heated bed, and it gets up to temperature, lickety split. And yeah, that's just, that quite warm heating element. And so I'm hoping that by sealing this off with very insulative walls, that just that bed will get the chamber up to like, I don't know, 75 degrees. Now, previously using, well, that old printer, not in that chamber, that's the old chamber, but I was using that old printer way back when in another video, um, you know, a couple of years ago, three years ago. And I was using a cardboard chamber and I got up to 50 degrees. In, inside that chamber, I was able to get to 50 degrees. So cardboard, ghetto as it may seem, is actually a very good insulator. It's got a front wall and a back wall and an airspace in between. And that's basically the same construction as your house. We got the drywall on the inside. We got some plywood sheeting on the outside. And in between, we got an airspace, you know, filled up with, with insulation, but it's just an airspace. So yeah, cardboard is, it's not as ghetto as it seems. It's actually a pretty decent material to make your first chamber out of. All right, let me put the chamber over the printer. 
that's not very pretty and you can't see the printer working. But what I've done is I cut out this square here and I can pull like so to pull it back out. It's like a friction fit and there's a plate of glass right there so that the heat is not gonna all escape from the chamber. But this allows me to see inside the printer uh, and check on the print as it's going. Now, looking at this box from the side, we can see the slope and I basically cut off that corner there just to remove a bunch of airspace. I don't need to be heating that air way up high, but why is the box so much taller than the printer? The answer is because it covers the filament spool holder here, but why didn't I put the spool holder on the outside of the printer and make my box a whole lot smaller? And the reason for that is because the heated chamber will be, I don't know, 75 degrees, which is quite warm and that will keep my filament dry, which is a much better option than having a separate chamber like this one that only gets to 50 degrees to keep your filament dry while you're printing. So yeah, the KISS principle at work. Keep it simple, stupid. You have one chamber for keeping the filament dry and also for printing inside of. Okay, this point needs to be hammered home. All of the high performance plastics, starting with ABS and nylon and polycarbonate and like all of them, all of the good ones, they all are extremely sensitive to the moisture in the air. So they soak that moisture in just tiny little amounts from the air and that really affects your print quality. So you absolutely must keep your filament dry. And if you're doing a print that lasts more than a couple of hours, just those couple of hours being exposed to the air uh, can cause the the filament to, to get wet and it will print poorly. So you need to keep the filament roll dry the entire time you're printing. And just a few degrees above room temperature or above ambient will is enough to make um, that to drive the moisture out of the air inside of the chamber. So it doesn't have to be much, just like two or three degrees even. So at you know 50 degrees, which is you know 20 degrees or so more above room temperature, you'll have no problem, and that filament roll absolutely will stay bone dry. Now I'm considering cutting a door in the front so that I don't have to lift the whole chamber off the printer every time I start or stop a print. But by cutting that door in there and, you know, maybe putting a couple of hinges, having it, you know, not, maybe, you know, maybe it seals up pretty well, like that top one up there, but no matter what I do, it's still going to be a leakage point where, uh, you know, it's gonna decrease the efficiency of the insulated chamber. So that's going to necessitate some sort of a heater element to keep that, uh, the chamber up to the right temperature. And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping, that I can get away without that. Let's test the current setup and see how hot the chamber can get. Here's the thermistor close to the top of the printer for measuring chamber temperature. And we'll just turn this on, put the lid on it. Well, you can see on the timer there that after about mm, 41 minutes, we're at 51 degrees in the chamber. So we got to 50 degrees at about the 38 minute mark and it's still climbing, you guys. And here at the chamber, I've got my multimeter hooked up to the uh, thermocouple, the K-type thermocouple, and we're getting a similar reading, 52 degrees. Touching the, uh, the metal down here below the printer, I'm getting very little thermal bridging. That's just ever so slightly warmer than room temperature. It's pretty spiffy. And just to show off the isolation of the electronics, look, here's the, uh, the, here's the chamber. And if I lift up the printer here, we can see there's the uh, duet control board. There's the X stepper motor right there. There's the Y stepper motor right over here. There's the power supply, all this exposed to, you know, room temperature, isolated from the hot environment inside of the chamber. Well, you can see on the timer there that after about mm, 41 minutes, we're at 51 degrees in the chamber. So we got to 50 degrees at about the 38 minute mark and it's still climbing, you guys. And after a little bit more than an hour and a half, you can see that we've reached a temperature yeah, pretty close to uh, 60 degrees. So uh, I think that 60 degrees is the upper limit for the chamber temperature at this setup, but I could potentially uh, achieve a higher temperature if I put a fan blowing across the bed. So stripping the heat off the bed, causing the bed to, to be pumping more energy into it, which would uh, the heat the chamber better. So that's an option. Or I could also put a heating element in there. All right, so the inside of this chamber is currently measured at 57 degrees. Taking the lid off, let's put the thermocouple on the metal here and see what it gets up to. That feels about about what my 50 degree bed would feel like. So you can see that all of the metal here is a giant heat sink. Well, not much of a heat sink, it's more of a thermal mass that has to get up to the same temperature as the air in the chamber. And that includes the motion rails here, the, uh, the crossbar. So pretty much everything in the chamber is going to become the same temperature as the chamber. So 75 degrees, 
Well, heat your bed up to 75 degrees and try touching the bed. You'll see just how uncomfortable that is. So this is why you need a special printer to really go the distance and last in these very harsh conditions. Touching the side here, it's quite warm there. Still warm, still warm, getting cooler. Getting a lot cooler. Above ambient though, and still cool. Yeah, pretty nice. Down here, feels warmer than the room temperature, but not too bad, not too bad at all. Well, there's still a lot that I need to do to this printer before it's in tip-top condition. We're, we're making good progress, but um, let's talk about, first of all, the safety concern. I'm using two solid-state relays underneath there, and those are the inexpensive Chinese clones of uh, the very high-quality Western-made uh, SSRs. I'm definitely going to replace those, and the reason is that solid-state relays, when they fail, they fail in the closed condition, so the, the current is being fed to the heaters. And so even though I've got thermal runaway protection uh, on the control board, if the control board read, you know, oh my god, temperatures are climbing like crazy, turn the heaters off, the signal would get sent from the control board and the SSRs would stay on and the heaters would stay going. So there is a potential there for um, runaway heaters that catch things on fire. And, you know, I haven't seen or even heard of 3D printers catching on fire since the ANET A8. So thankfully, I think we're beyond, you know, we, the quality has gotten good enough that we're beyond, you know, printers just spontaneously going up in flames. But if my printer did go up in flames, as I showed, this polystyrene would not be able to withhold or withstand any of those flames. And it would self melt and catch on fire and then probably the whole house would burn down. So it could be really bad. So definitely replace the SSRs is the plan and probably going to remake the chamber with that poly iso insulation just because it's probably got twice to three times the um the fire resistance of the polystyrene so there's that all right safety concerns aside what's uh what's next for fun i'm definitely going to cut the door into the front and add a heated element like a, like just a, a heater basically to get that temperature or to get the temperature inside the chamber up and with that extra you know heat being pumped in there along with the bed i think that i can you know make up for any losses through the seams of the door of course i would also love to put a camera inside of the chamber with some led lights so i can see what's going on in there without having to uh, open that window and yeah, that's, that'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a really, uh, just a high quality printer when I get those things added. It's gonna be a while though because the most important thing is just having a functional printer and those are just sort of like usability concerns. But uh, as far as having a functional printer, uh, there's one major thing missing and that is a bed leveling probe. So at 50 degrees ambient temperature, the BL Touch probe stops working. It just flashes red, you can't use it anymore. And that means I pretty much have to use a clicky switch to, to measure that bed. So I've got to put some sort of the servo arm clicky switch deal because I can't be um, getting in there you know, with my hands to attach a clicky switch to the hot end and then remove it. That would entail opening the chamber and losing all the heat. So I really need a way to automatically, like a BL Touch, have a de deployable probe. And I've got something in mind, you guys, something that's really quite trick. And I have not seen this technique anywhere on the internet. I went looking. Um, it's a combination of things that you've already seen in 3D printing, but nobody's done it quite this way. So I'm really excited for the next video when I'm going to implement that, uh, that bed leveling functionality. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, big thank you to these guys. These are my Patreon supporters. And without these guys, I would have quit. I say it every single time, and I mean it every single time. These guys keep the channel going. They do. They make me feel good about making these videos, even though I don't have the largest viewership. So thank you so, so much. And with that, we'll end this video. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.